The Connecticut Music Oral History Podcast is a deep dive interview series with musicians, artists, conduits, collectors, and dedicated fans, focusing on 20th century Connecticut music history. This project preserves narratives, heralds unsung movers and shakers, and defines Connecticut's influential role in cultural history. I'm your host, Brendan Toller. I'm an artist, a musician, a filmmaker, and marketing manager of the incredible Verso Studios at the Westport Library, where this very podcast is being produced. Verso Studios is a media resource and production hub, serving as an inclusive, empowered, future-forward cultural and learning center. A library branch of the 21st century, Verso Studios provides programming, commercial services, as well as educational and content creation opportunities. We have a state-of-the-art hybrid analog recording studio designed in part by Rob Fraboni, the same guy who built Keith Richards' home studio down the road. We record bands, artists, audiobooks, podcasts, and everything in between. We have video production suites, classes, and events. Check us out at the Verso Studios website and on social media. I'm thrilled to welcome one of my best friends, Kelly Riley, onto the first episode of the Connecticut Music Oral History Podcast. Kelly Riley is a musician and rock and roll interlocutor who has held court at the center of New Haven, Connecticut's vibrant music scene. Let's first listen to a new track she released months ago. Here's Kelly Riley's take on Ballrooms of Mars by T-Rex. You gonna look fine Be proud for dancing You gonna trip and glide all on a trampoline plane Your diamond hands will be stacked with roses And wind and cars and people of the past I'll call you thing just when the moon sings And place your face in stone upon a hill of stars and gripped in the arms of the changeless madman will dance our lives away in the ballrooms of Mars You talk about day I'm talking about night time When monsters You're gonna trip and glide all on the trembling play Your diamond hands will be stacked with roses And wind and cars and people of the past I'll call you feeling just when the moon This madman will 
So, hi, Kelly Riley. Good evening. <laughs> so let's let's start from the beginning. You know, where are you from? What was the first piece of music you heard or record you bought? Oh, wow. Well, starting real young? Yeah. Uh, well, my parents had really good records. Like what? So um, the first record I ever remember was uh, Here's Little Richard, that album. With the screaming face on yeah, the front yeah, cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like the first one that I can really remember. But um, they had all kinds of records. Janis Joplin, Sly and the Family Stone, um, of course, Elvis, the Beatles, uh, kind of everything. But um, what changed my life was when I stole my older brother's T-Rex, the Slider album, when I was about 10. And I didn't know anything about it. I just went in his room, saw that cover, and it spoke to me. I felt some kind of weird connection, and uh, I pinched it. And as soon as I turned it on, I was instantly obsessed with Mark Bolin from the very beginning of Metal Guru. And The Slider remains my favorite album in the world for my entire life. Like, nothing will touch that album for me. Um, It's my Bible. It's, like, gotten me through life. And Ballrooms of Mars remains my favorite song since I was a kid. And um, Baby Strange, I named my band after. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, talk about your high school experience. I mean, we've talked before, obviously, and it it sounds like you probably have um, the usual Connecticut experience of of maybe... uh, some razzing or bullying. I, oh I mean, creative gosh. types in Connecticut. I think a, a lot of places get that. I was, I was bullied when I was in the middle school. Um, I just used to block it all out with the T Rex slider album always in my head. But um, uh, yeah, I was harassed because I grew up in North Haven, and I did not fit in. Everybody there was wearing um, rabbit fur coats and clogs. And I was going, starting at like 12, I started going to New York and getting clothes. You know, I was wearing all punk rock clothes, you know, leopard, red leopard leggings and all kinds of boots. And so I was, uh, yeah, I was harassed. Mm. But once I started the band and uh, most of the girls, except for the drummer, also went to North Haven. So once we started the band, um, nobody really bothered me anymore. How did you meet Marcy LaBella? Um, I met her, I can't remember what class it was. I met her in a class. Yeah. Yeah. And Deb, I guess I must have met Big Deb, who was our bass player. They were also, she was also at the school? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't remember which class I met him in. Was it kind of like a look thing, or was it like, like how, how, how did you know? Sense of humor? I don't really remember. Probably both, We just right? connected, yeah. you know, and yeah. kind of like... Uh, if, if anybody was different in any way, like, we just hung out. Makes you know? sense. Yeah. yeah. So uh, how did you get to Ron's place? How did you discover the New Haven scene? I, you know, I can't even remember how I discovered it. I started going into New Haven and New York when I was, like, 12. Um, I was always in, in New Haven. I would go to Cutler's all the time. Record and, store. Um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, Al Lotto was working there. And he would um, order me all the import T Rex records because you couldn't get you couldn't get a lot of T Rex, you know. Besides Electric Warrior and the Slider, you know, maybe Tanks, but all the other stuff. So I used to order all the imports, and um, I can't really remember how we found out about Ron's place. But we started hanging there. You know, we were so young; we were like fourteen, um, 
and we had to get notes from our parents so we could play there. Uh, and Ron loved us. Ron would look at the notes? Uh, I don't <laughs> think he cared, but I at mean, least we had them. You know what I mean? Just so in case in cops case showed needed, up? Yeah, we had to have these notarized notes that we, um, we, could, we, weren't, we couldn't be near the bar. Mm-hmm. So it was like a certain amount of feet we had to be away from the bar. So, uh, but we, we were there every night. Like that was our, that was our home away from home and we would stay out all night and then we'd go to Howard Johnson's in North Haven and I would get uh, chocolate almond ice cream and they had those good cookies in them and tea. And then we'd go home at like four and we'd get up a couple hours later and go to school. So, uh, I don't don't know how, you know, (laughs) one thing that I think is really inspiring, uh, to Everybody is, and maybe you could talk about it. You you've never uh, smoked, you never drank, no drugs, nothing. So I mean, I would think even at a teenage level, you might have the curiosity never crossed your mind at Ron's place, where, where it was just there, or in the music scene. Talk about it a little bit. Yeah, never ever. Yeah, it's a fun Kelly fact. Never ever tried alcohol. Any drugs, no pills, nothing, nothing, just nothing. Um, it never appealed to me. Uh, I remember in school just seeing everybody all f***ed up. And to me, that's just, I don't know. I had no curiosity about it. I don't have the desire to do anything that alters my mind. I just, I want to know what I'm doing at all times. To me, that just doesn't appeal to me. And um, when I was like 16, my boyfriend who was, like six years older, was a heroin addict. And I didn't even know what heroin was, really. So I saw a lot of grisly shit. He was also an alcoholic. So um, that sealed it. <laughs> I was just like, no. Mm-mm. I don't know. And I've always hung out my whole life heavy in the music scene. Um, but to me, it's just all about the music and the people. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, you know, our... I was talking to a friend Dan about this the other day, and uh, we were talking about like, well, how do you stand, you know, not being in an altered state of mind when so many people are? And his response was, um, "There's so much in life to engage with." Yeah, it's true. Like to me, I couldn't even imagine altering my state of mind. It's, it's unimaginable to me. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Um. So describe. Well, tell us. You know, the full band band members of Baby Strange, Mach 1, and kind of the aesthetic, the style, the sound? Baby Strange, the first version was all girls. Uh, it was Marcy Di Nicola, who's now Marcy LaBella, um, Debbie Colby, um, Kathy Milani, and uh, Lynn Lacoste. I'm not sure, she was our drummer, I'm not sure what happened to her. Uh, Marcy and Kathy played guitar, Big Deb played bass. Um, we were just punk rock. I mean, it was just like, just pure fun, you know, that's all. It, it was just, we just had a good time, you know. Um, the second version of Baby Strange was me and all guys, and that was uh, more of a new wave sound. You know, totally different songs. We didn't do any of the stuff that we did with the first version. How, how did you guys write songs? Um... I just kind of collaborative all down in Big Deb's basement where we used to rehearse. At her and parents' house? Yeah, at her father's. In North yeah. Haven? Mm-hmm. Cool. And, uh, you know, I'd bring some lyrics and, or else someone would come in and say, I want to cover this. And we covered some T-Rex, of course, some Sex Pistols. Uh, I think we're alone now, Tommy James. Because this is like, what, 79? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, we did some Rolling Stones. Just, with, you know... Originals and some covers here and there. Yeah, I think, um, you know, people know uh, cover bands and how awful they are. <laughs> but I think, I think covers for a band that wants to do original material is really important in the beginning because it, it can help you sort of hone and, and define your sound, right? Like it's, you have ideas of what you want to sound like, so by performing those songs, you can get a sense and feel confident in what you're doing, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yep. Yeah, and it was a good mix that we had. But, you know, and back then there were there were a bunch of clubs in New Haven. 
Yeah, could you just give us like a visual description of Ron's? <laughs> if you can, I mean, like, what was it like going in there? Like, I, I mean, uh, I know we know it now. It's so it's on the corner of what streets? It's on the corner of Chapel, and I was thinking the other day, George. No, what is that street? It's crazy that I can't remember. I mean, I know exactly where it is, but right. I can't remember the street name of yeah. the corner. Uh, the one before How. Right. What's before How? It's not York, is it? No, because that's Toads. Yeah. Yeah, this is, you know, further down. Not Broadway, no. No. Nope. I should look it up on my phone. It's now a yeah. restaurant called Barracuda. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But Ron's, it was a shithole. <laughs> yeah, it was a shithole. And there was a couch? Yeah. But you didn't sit on the couch, right? No, you couldn't sit on that you were couch. likely to pick something mm-hmm. up off yeah. the couch. Yeah. Bed bugs or yeah. Yeah, scabies yeah. or crabs. Yep. And was there a jukebox? Yeah. What, what was on it? I remember a lot of times what was playing on it was um, For Your Love. Yard, is that the Yardbirds? That's a great song, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. And Ron's was quite a mix of people, you know. It was all kinds. Hippies, punk rockers, regular looking people. It was just all kinds of people. Why do you think it was Ron's? Did he have some sort of... Uh vision for original music or was it just such a dump that he was like all right we'll see if this works here i don't really know i don't really know <laughs> and ron ron was really nice though he was really nice to us yeah he how old was he then i don't know it was hard to tell middle age because oh, really? we were so young yeah. you know yeah but he looked like charles manson <laughs> he did he looked just like him but and, he, he was so nice to us and the thing that i you know gather from Ron's place is like that crew has really stuck together yeah yeah we were like a family everybody and ev- everybody was just so nice you know who, who are some of the people you met there protective of us like uh Craig and Claude Bell um of course Mark Mulcahy Mark was a drummer back then and at one point when our drummer left Mark Mulcahy was our drummer with the you know the girl version of Baby Strange that was fun Mm-hmm. Did you meet Tom Hearn there? Yeah, I met Tom Hearn there. Yep. Ron Sutphin? I don't really remember him from that far back. Yeah. Yeah. And Ron's went till like what, like mid 80s or? Mm, I should know all this. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I mean, there were, like uh, you said, I, so what were some of the other 80, venues? Maybe 83 tops. Yeah. yeah. There was the Oxford Ale House that was on Whitney Avenue. And now it's like some... A good nature market, right? Yes. With the windows. And that's where the stage was? Yeah, that's where the stage was. And that's where I met Dean Falcone. Tell that story. John Bryan. Yeah. Um, Baby Strange was playing there. And um, we saw these... You know, we were like 14. They were like 15 or something. Or we were 15. They were 14. Their faces were pressed up against the glass. They were, that's how they could watch the show because they couldn't get in. And then when we went outside, we met them. And they had their teenage band, the Excerpts. They were a really, really good pop band. And um, and that was who? Say who that was. Uh, it was Dean Falcone, John Bryan, um, Steve. How could I forget his last name? This is horrible. <laughs> they were a really good band. And Jim I mean, Balga, though, right? He came, at some He point? wasn't there right in the beginning. Okay. He came a little yeah. later. But they, they played Japan and everything. I mean, they, they were really good. But Baby Strange and the Excerpts would do shows and hang out together all the time and stuff. So uh, they're my, like, childhood friends. And you said that they had their nose pressed up against the glass, right, watching you guys? Yeah, they were pressed. They were, up, they were look, looking through the glass. It's the only way you could see because, you, you know, they couldn't get in. So they saw the show that way. That, you could, we would do that sometime if we wanted to go look at a show. Yeah. And Baby Strange tried to record a couple times, right, the all-woman all version of it? Um, I, I thought we were scheduled to once, but I, I, I don't think we ever did. Demos my, or anything? My, not that version. My second version okay. had some demos. Yeah. And that version was um, my friend who was the drummer in the cars, David Robinson, one of my best friends. He loved that version of Baby Strange, and he wanted to produce us. And it was when the cars were the biggest band in the country. 
and they had their own recording studio, Synchro Sound, um, on Newberry Street. And he was going to get Rick involved Rick in okay, producing, sick, right? yeah, in producing and everything. And he, you know, he loved our songs. And right before we were like set, like to go in, uh, the band broke up because I had the junkie and the hippie, and they hated each other. And they both wrote like probably each half and half of the songs, um, and so they just like broke the band up. That sucked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's totally sucked. Never because, fun to deal with. No, and plus back then. That was a time when if someone was a rock star, they could help you. <laughs> David, you know, he was so the surprised. The cars were huge then. Yeah, he w- they were the biggest band in the country. They were massive. And he was so surprised that they would do that because he was all set to help us. And he had gotten us a show at the Rat, and he had the Cars Sound guy uh, mix us that night. It sounded amazing. It was really cool. Mm. And um, you guys played a little bit outside New Haven, right? Rhode Island, uh, we played... At Lupo's? Uh, the Living Room. Okay, Living Room, right. Yeah. We played um, in, in New York, Max's, Kansas City. And who'd you play with at Max's? The Senders. Oh, right. Yeah, they Very were great. Cool. Yeah. Um, I was mostly just excited because in Baby Boomerang, the T-Rex song, he mentions Max's, Kansas City. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to play there, and that's all I cared about. Was it about. E- everything you dreamed of? It's all I cared about. I mean, yeah. I think by then it was a different place than, like, what is mythologized, you know, from the late sixties, early seventies. Not that it yeah. wasn't I mean it's still right. it's still Max's, but Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Um so uh I mean, did it ever feel like you had to get out of New Haven to sort of make it? I mean, I think what's great for me about the New Haven scene is there's like a national illusion that you have to go to New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco, you know, one of the major cities with for, you know, bohemia and art and music, and that's the only way you're going to get your art together. But New Haven's so inspiring to me because people have done it for years, and it's a it's a small scene, but it's tight and it's supportive, it's intergenerational, and um, I just think it's, it's a great hidden secret. <laughs> yeah, I mean, New Haven was always just a big music city, arts, music, yeah. I mm-hmm. never, I never felt like I had to go anywhere else. Who were some of your contemporaries then in New Haven? Um, I mean, I know there probably weren't really because there wasn't like an all women band, you know. No, there probably. was not. <laughs> no, it was just us. But who would have been on some similar bills, I guess? Um, the Poodle Boys. What were they like? Ah, oh, they were so good. They were really, really good. You know, like punk pop with a. Uh, Jamie McGann, the singer, he's such a great performer, too. Um, there are the Saucers, you know, like Craig Bell's band, um, Hot Bodies. There was a lot of good music, a lot of disturbance. Yeah, I should know more of them right now, but... <laughs> yeah, the Snots. The Snots, uh, yeah, the Snots. The Furors. Yep, they're still around. It's they amazing. Are. Well, I think they retired. <laughs> They did? I, yeah, I think so. I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's, I'm off, I maybe shouldn't be oh, speaking ahead of myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing yeah, yeah, that yeah. they stayed together <laughs> all that time, you know? Yeah. Um, so. And Tom Hearn was always around with his camera. <laughs> video or uh, still? Or both still, sometimes. Um, yeah, still. And, and Claude Bell. She she took so many great pictures. She is amazing. Yeah, photos. yeah, she does. Really great. Yeah. And it seems like Craig was a big supporter of the scene then, right? Oh, huge, huge, yeah. Yeah, yeah really great people, too. Saucers, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, so then after Mach 2 of Baby Strange, you, you sort of, you took a break, right, for a little bit until maybe 90s or something like that or late 80s? Musically, mm, I'm saying. Uh, yeah, <laughs> 90s-ish. Yeah, 90s. Yeah. Yeah, I've always just like just taking breaks depending on mm-hmm. just what's going on in my life and you know. Yeah, that and then I went into kind of a weird phase of music that Well, I want to go back to that cuz I think there's such an expectation of like once you do something and I, I mean especially people like it they expect you to keep doing it. 
And they don't want you to take a break. They don't want you to do something else. They don't want you to be different. Like it's, I mean, you know, I guess I'm speaking from my own experience, right? <laughs> you know, where's your next film is every other question coming out of people's mouth towards me. It seems like sometimes, but, um, you know, uh, I mean, you miss it, right? Like when you're away from a certain art form, like you probably missed the band. Yeah. Well, anytime I wasn't doing anything with music, it's always just been, I'll do it. i do it soon. You know, I, I never really planned on taking breaks for as long as I did. Well, and um, I think uh, and seeing it, music and hearing music like live oh, and on record, that's uh, that's yeah. a lifelong thing. You're never going to get I've, away from that. <laughs> I've started going to shows when I was a little kid and never stopped. Yeah. Never. Always, always have to see live music, except for the shutdown. <laughs> yeah. Wait, but I'm forgetting, if you don't mind talking about it, you ran away from home for, <laughs> for a bit. Can't glance that over. It's the only bad thing I ever did, because I didn't I didn't do anything bad as a kid. Never did anything bad, but when I did do something bad, it was real bad. <laughs> you know, um, we were fourteen, and uh, it was when we were we just starting the band, me and you know Big Deb, and um, we wanted we decided we wanted to move to Boston because we wanted to like start our band there. And she had this joint bank account with her father, Harv. And um, so she went to the bank and took out $10,000. And we decided to um, get an apartment in Boston and then jump on a plane to follow Aerosmith on tour. <laughs> and you knew Aerosmith and their crew by then, yeah? Um, not re- not well or anything. I mean, I'd, I had met them, you know, I'd first met Steven Tyler when I was like 13 at, at the Chapel Square Mall in, in Rite Aid. <laughs> but, um, yeah, what a crazy idea, you know? Uh, $10,000 was a lot of money to take out of a bank account. Still is. It's, it's huge. But it was a joint, so really, she didn't really rip them off because it was under her name, too. I would have never done that, though. I would have never come up with that. That was, like, her idea. I would have never... Ever. I wouldn't have stole a penny from my father. But, um, so, yeah, my father found us. We, you know, we, well, first we went to... Well, um, was it to go to an Aerosmith show, or they were recording out there? We were going like to just go to a bunch of Aerosmith shows, and then, you know, go... We had first... What year was this? Like, uh, 74, 75? 78. Wow, okay, we, so it was like Aerosmith was starting to... They were on. They're on their descent a little bit, right? Uh, they're, they, they're were, dr- they were. Huge I mean, they were massive, though. but massive. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, drug and mind wise. Oh yeah. <laughs> um. So, when we ran away, uh, we had this crazy plan. We said we were sleeping out in my backyard in a tent, <laughs> and Deb lived I don't know how many miles away. So in the middle of the night. We strapped my suitcase to a, um, how, how come I keep forgetting words? A skateboard. I don't know why I'm fried. Uh, strapped it to a skateboard and wheeled it in the middle of the night to Deb's garage and then walked back to my house. Then in the morning, we told my mother, oh, we're going to Deb's. We walked to Deb's house. Her father went to work. She called the Highs Limousine Service. I was going to say, because you're, what, 14? You can't drive, right? Right. She <laughs> called the limousine. We went downtown New Haven. She withdrew the ten grand, and she was tall and everything. She looked, you know, she, she could have easily passed for 18. She got the money, and we drove to Boston. We got a paper, um, found an apartment. It was like we were renting a room in this guy's house. And um, so we threw all our stuff down, and then Aerosmith was we're going to be in Arizona. So we flew out there, and we checked into the hotel, and then we found out the show canceled. And it, Arizona was disgustingly hot. God, they say, oh, Because this is in the summer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they say, oh, but it's not humid. When it's 110 degrees, it's hot. I don't care. It's hot. And there were also um, these soggy bagels in the shower with bugs all over them. They, they were raisin bagels. I remember that, and I remember the bugs. So we went and got our money back. We said, there's soggy, 
rotten bagels in the shower. We got our money back, got on a plane, went to L.A., checked into the Hyatt house. And had you made contact with Aerosmith then? No, Nobody. no. Nobody. No. You went to Arizona, it was a bust, and then you went to L.A. Went to L.A. And then what? To the Hyatt house. Of course. Then we went to uh, North Beach Leather, had some leather pants fitted to us that like laced up the size. And you and had $10,000. Yeah, we did not? that. We bought some diamond earrings. Um, we went to, let's see, we went to a, one of their shows, um, we saw them all and everything, and, um, Did you have to pay for a ticket, or are you on a list? No, we just, we just got in. I just, <sighs> I got in everywhere, just, I don't, I don't even remember, but we went to that show, and, uh, we were, we were headed, like, to the next show, and I was always... I was always, like, ready to go. Like, I was always, like, up early, ready. Because I, I felt like we were on the lam. We had to keep it moving, even though we were registered under different names. Felt like we had to keep it moving. And so we were, um, we had finished breakfast. Well, well, I had. I was ready to go. And Deb was, like, cream cheese in her bagel and drinking lemonade. And I was like, come on, we got to go, we got to go. And then we had a knock at the door, and it was the, the popo. Mm. The cops came, and... Uh, we didn't know there weren't any runaway laws there, and they handcuffed us and um, took us to the Hollywood jail. <laughs> what was that like? Um, well, I remember getting in the back of the cop car, and it was the f- it had just come out. The car is just what I needed, and I was like, "Holy fuck! What is this?" You know, like. It was Bowie-ish, but I knew it wasn't Bowie. Ben's voice was just like, oh, my God. That song. The production on that oh is my just God. unreal. I just heard that yeah. song on my iPod the other day. It still gets me the same way as it did from the first time I heard it. So we just kind of made the best of the ride. And uh, we were singing songs and stuff. And um, then I had to wait a whole bunch of hours. My father... As it turns out, we were on the guest list for the next show. It was in, I forget where it was. And my father had contacted Aerosmith's management and asked if they saw me. How did he you know? I don't know. He never really gave me the information, and now he's gone, and I'll never have it. He, he, he found shit out somehow. <laughs> um, but he was going to be at the next show, so I would have been backstage in my new North Beach leather pants. You know, I had a pimp hat with a feather in it and, you know, these platform boots and stuff. And then I would have run into Big Daddy. <laughs> so I guess when he he was on his way there, when he landed in Chicago in his layover or something, they told him um, that they found us and they were holding us. So I think I had to, I think I was in the jail for like eight or nine hours. With other people? Or was no, we you? were in a little private cell, oh, me lucky, and Deb. Yeah. And, um, he came to get me. He would have taken her home, too, but her father wanted her to stay with her brother in Utah for a month. He didn't really want to see her right yeah, away. That, yeah. so she, and she, she was fine with that. She would, wanted to go stay with her brother. So um, I think he was on his way to get her as well. But I was so mad. I was a little shit, you know. My father's like, you know, come on, we got to go. And, you know, he was all, like, sweet and creamy. And I was like, no, I'm not leaving. I'm on the guest list. I got to go to the Aerosmith concert. He's like, we can't. We have to go. I was so mad. And then I was like, well, fine then. I want a pizza. <laughs> I didn't know what pizza was like in California. Ew. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cardboard with oh, ragu. Oh, yeah. it was horrifying. Yeah. And then we got on our plane, and uh, we were sitting with Pink Floyd, next to Pink Floyd. On the plane? Yeah, they were all just sitting there. <laughs> yeah, which was pretty cool. I mean, I didn't talk to them or anything. Mm-hmm. They were there. And then we get home, and I said to my father um, on the way home, I said, oh, we need to go to Boston tomorrow. He's like, why? I said, oh, because I have an apartment there. All my stuff is there. <laughs> so he, they, that's one move they hadn't traced of ours. So um, he drove me there. And the guy that rented us the room, he's like, why are you moving out? And my, I remember my father giving him devil eyes and saying, because she's 14. We got all our stuff, and, you know, that was that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I kind of laid down the law in my house after that because because I was a girl. You know, my parents never wanted me going to the concerts. My older brother could go do whatever he wanted. I couldn't, and I was like, I'm not doing anything bad. 
I'm not drinking. I'm not doing drugs. I'm not having sex. I just want to go to concerts and play, start my band and play with my band. He had a band, and that was fine. He could go wherever he wanted. Once I ran away, I laid down the law. And I said, listen, I'm going to go where I want. I'm not doing anything bad. I could either lie and go to a show somewhere, or I can tell you the truth. Right. But was, was going to school rough after a late night on a weekday? Um, you mean after, like, playing at Ron's? And yeah, stuff? stuff like that. Yeah, which is why we all, me, Marcy, Big Deb, and Kathy, we took double classes in high school, and we got out a year early. <laughs> Yeah. So you were 16, 17 when you graduated? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Done. Done by 17. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I had to get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't for me. You know, it was like every day I'd walk into school, I felt like I had just pulled up in a spaceship. Yeah. But you were also dressed. Like, what would you wear? I mean, you, you, Any- had, you had a special relationship with the principal, kind of. Anything I wanted. Yep. But what would that have been? Well, sometime, one time I remember I was real tired, and uh, I had stuff like an hour, and I had those, um, those feedy pajamas, the tight kind, and they were, um, uh, let's see, they were red and white striped, like a candy cane. Yeah. And then they had the hatch in the back. Mm-hmm. So I remember waking up one day so tired, I just, um, you know, with a, a pin, I pinned the back of it so it, could, you couldn't, it wouldn't come undone. I threw on my... Um, you know, my Doc Martens and a motorcycle jacket. I went to school like that. And I remember walking by the principal and him just like kind of looking at me like, um, hi, Kelly, you know, and then putting his head down, you so know. So he's scared of you, yeah. He was really nice, though. He was he was nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they, I think people turned out maybe kind of scared of me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I didn't bother anybody, you know. Yeah bother anybody but people bothered me yeah but then and then at a certain point you had like rock rock people calling your house right your parents yeah. house yeah. yeah that get annoying for them um well you, my we mother didn't have cell phones back then I mean, yeah, yeah i know so. yeah my mother now she'll talk about it she'd be like that that was so weird now that i think about it you know <laughs> yeah she said at the time it just seemed normal i mean i just had friends that were rock stars but it would have been the phone calls would have been like 3 a.m., right? Yeah. Yeah, she would just like, her room was across the hall from mine. My father would work nights, so he wasn't home. She'd be like yelling, Cal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to me, it just seemed normal. Yeah, if you're a musician, you're going to keep, you know. Right. Vampire hours. Right. <laughs> um, uh, jumping ahead. Yeah, you met Welcome, and then you, you sort of did different music with him and and other musicians and producers to talk about that a little bit because yeah you're on you're on a famous record my yeah you mean rupaul the rupaul one in um uh hello it's it's, oh that's right yeah Yeah. so my former husband welcome bienvenue um who's still like my family uh he was producing dance music and he had a studio, and um, he had all contact. He was really good friends with Junior Vasquez, the famous DJ in New York, and that's where all his contacts were. So I just ended up kind of thrown into doing some dance tracks. Uh, I was signed with a label called Strictly Rhythm. Um, that turned out because one day we were hanging out at Junior's, and he's like, oh, Kelly, um, call, let's see, um, call my answering machine and leave a message and, you know, say that it's Madonna um, and say, call me in Miami. I was like, Madonna? I was like, ew. I said, I, I, I don't sound like Madonna. He goes, no, just do it. Say it like this and just do it. So I called and did it. And, you know, I don't sound anything like her. And I didn't think anything of it. And then, I don't know, like maybe a couple months later, Welcome and I were in the car driving through New York City and it comes on the radio. Hi, Junior, this is Madonna, you know, and it's me. And the song is If Madonna Calls. And um, it's a Madonna diss song. You know, if Madonna (laughs) calls, disconnect her, it says. Um, I had no idea he was doing, like, that type of thing, you know. And I guess 
she didn't talk to him for, they were good friends and she didn't talk to him for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I was happy to be part of something that pissed Madonna off though, because who wouldn't be right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but so when I did that, he's like, well, either I could pay you or, um, you could put out a record on strictly rhythm. So then they signed me and I had a single out called come back to me. I also had a single out before that though, with, um, a label in Montreal called What Are You Gonna Do? Uh, I think because Welcome Welcomes from Montreal, he had some DJ friends who connected him with that. Um, so, yeah. So that, And then also, Welcome produced a couple records for RuPaul. Right. I had originally met Ru when I was, like, 19, and it was his first trip to the Pyramid Club in New York. He came up from Atlanta. And, and you I, were going I saw there his to hang out? Or? With my friend Emmett, yeah, yeah. We were going to hang out. And, you know, we didn't know who was going to be there. We just right. went, and it was Lady Bunny and RuPaul. And I was like, when Ru came out, I was like, oh, my God. I was like, you know, all these other queens are all crusty. I said, Ru was, like, fresh and dewy, and, and he was actually singing, you know, not lip syncing. So I, had, I said, I have to go meet him. So I went down there to talk to him, and he was just so funny and cool. I, I instantly loved him. And I hadn't seen him in a bunch of years. And then Welcome had to meet with him about producing him. We went to his apartment, and I went in, and I said, hey. I explained, you know, when I went to meet him, he's like, you know, I remember you. And uh, so it was cool whenever, well, all, Welcome would also do some work on RuPaul's condo because he's like a wizard of everything, Welcome is. So uh, he'd be working on Ru's place, and me and RuPaul would be lying in bed eating Krispy Kremes, watching, like, Divine movies. <laughs> Where'd you get Krispy Kremes? There was Krispy Kremes in New York. There was. Yeah, so I I brought the dozen. Rue would be in his pajamas. We'd hang out in his bed. And one time, one, twice, I think, we ate a dozen donuts. One time I brought a recipe of Rice Krispie treats that I, that I made. We ate the entire recipe, which I can do one of those on my own, too. But um, he was so much fun. And I sang backing vocals on a couple of his songs. Yeah, he was, and he used to come when Welcome had a studio, you know, in East Haven, and he Ru used to come and record there. Mm. And Donna Summer too. Welcome yeah, to he Donna had, Summer. You guys. Yeah, I think close. I think that's how Ru contact found him because he liked what he did on Donna Summers. Yeah, and Welcome and I became very good friends with Donna and her family. You know, they were like family to us. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, so that were you into her music like in the seventies, or was it a different well, connection once he once he met her? Probably both, um, right? In the seventies, no, it wasn't right. what, what it wasn't what I was listening thing. to. No, yeah. I wasn't listening to I mean, disco. I feel I love's was, great, but yeah. I was yeah, I was punk rock, so yeah. it was like I was not <laughs> listening to disco. Um, but Welcome was, and that was his favorite singer on the planet when he was you know growing up. So for him to be able to produce her and um, you know get to be good friends with her. It's just so cool. So cool. That's like me, you know, producing and hanging out with Mark Bolin, you know. Um, but, I mean, I do love her voice. I mean, she's, I mean, like, she would sing around the house. We'd stay at her house and stuff. Amazing. Just, mm-hmm. th- there's there's not really many voices like hers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, so I do definitely appreciate it. Yeah. And then. Um, Super cool lady. Just the sweetest. Yeah. And now you're back in rock and roll again. Now I'm back. Yep. Back. How did it all happen? <laughs> How did yeah, that I started doing music again? Yeah, yeah. And talk about like who with, yeah, uh, yeah, the whole thing. Well, it's because I met Richard Dev Breen. Right. <laughs> who is a singer, songwriter, producer from New York City. He was um, singing with the Plim Souls at Cafe Nine, and your band was opening for them, <laughs> Dust Hat. <laughs> yeah. So I was out there uh, with Deb Sutphin, and um, she, at the end of the sh- night, I was looking for her to take her to her car. And I hadn't seen their show because after Dust Hat, the air conditioning broke, and it was like August 31st. And was, was that the night that Kate O'Reardon was playing with them? Yeah, yeah, Kate wow. was playing with them. Um, but I didn't see their show because the air conditioning broke after Dust Hat, so it was cooler outside. Miss Kelly don't like the heat. So 
I was outside. And so I was looking for Deb at the end of the night to take her to her car, and she was talking to Richard, and that's how we met. Um, but um, he, I think I had probably maybe sent him some stuff that I had done, just, you know, just tracks to hear my voice. And um, he pretty much forced me to record Ballrooms of Mars. Um, he knew that my whole life I had planned on covering my favorite song, and he kind of just forced me, like made it happen. And um, we recorded the vocals at a studio in Brooklyn called uh, Mighty Toad. And then after that, I brought it to Dean Falcone. And um, he worked his magic at Firehouse 12 with Greg DeCrosta. Um, so between Richard and Dean, you know, it's, it came out like mm -hmm. more amazing than I ever could have imagined. Mm. But I knew I had the Mark Boland kind of voice because that's just where my voice is, yeah, goes, you right, know? Right. So because if I couldn't, I would never have done it. I would not do it. I don't like when people cover T-Rex. I don't like it. It's like, stay away from it. I don't like it. So, But you did it. I did it. And um, a bunch of uh, T-Rex Facebook groups in the UK found me because, um, amazingly enough, Joe Elliott from Def Leppard played it on his Planet Rock show. So some of those people tracked me down on Facebook, and they're like, Joe Elliott just played your Ballrooms of Mars. I was like, what? And um, his introduction was amazing, and I saw that he purchased it on Bandcamp, and uh, I emailed him and thanked him and stuff, and we went back and forth a little bit. Really, really nice guy. He's a huge T-Rex fan. So anyway, all these T-Rex uh, fans in the UK, they don't like people covering Mark Bolin either. Like, they're like me. But they all have given it such an amazing reception. They love it. And, like, I'm Facebook friends with a bunch of them. And um, I wish I could actually, you know, September 16th will be the anniversary of Mark's death. And um, I wish I could go there because they have all kinds of celebrations from of Mark. And um, I'm hoping next September I'll be able to get over there because I want to meet these people. You know, they're just, I feel like I found my people. Mm -hmm. You know, they're from my planet. They're from planet Bolin. It's just, uh, they're just so, so nice. So mm -hmm. nice. It's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm so happy they found me. Yeah. And then you released um, Ready for the Morning? Yes, that was also recorded. Um, and we recorded this, like, the shutdown. When did that start? Was that March? March 2020. The, the summer before that was when we started recording. Yeah. Um, Ballrooms of Mars and Ready for the Morning, which Richard wrote for me. And so it's all the same people, you know, and then Dean got involved and all that. And I put that out a couple months ago. I still need a video for it, Brendan. Oh, geez, yeah. <laughs> We'll talk later. Yeah, because oh. Ballrooms on Mars has an amazing video that, you know, Richard's best friend, Luke Miller, made for me, which is just so, it's like a walk through my life, as you know, all kinds of footage. And my friend Ulf Rasmussen, who was from the Ron's Place scene, who lives in Denmark, he's back in Denmark now, he uh, sent me over the Baby Strange footage from Ron's, so they incorporated that in the video, and it's just really, it came out so cool, really cool. Mm. You said before you think that you grew up in the uh, best possible time. Oh, my God. Uh, the 70s? <laughs> the best time for music. No f cell phones. Um, you know, because everybody just lives on their phone. They can't even live real life. I don't know. It, it was just a better time. It was a better world. You know, you would have rather. Lived I, you know, I, I I don't know that I can argue. <laughs> <laughs> you would have rather lived then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about some of your favorite artists. So I'll just I'll just name some names. So uh, David Bowie. We uh, talked a lot about Mark Bowen, but David Bowie. Yeah. My God, yes, those are my two gods. Do you remember actually. when you first heard him, or what you saw, or? Um, I'm, I don't remember when I first heard him, but I remember like just, oh my God, just going nuts. Like if he was on like. American Bandstand or just anything, you know. I had a bunch of his records when I was young, too. It was, you know, Bowling and Bowie, they kind of go together. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was obsessed with him, too. Like, I, when I was a kid, I always thought, you know, 
maybe I would marry him. <laughs> Did it seem possible? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would think just based on your traje- trajectory, I mean, <laughs> getting, so getting an apartment at 14, like you in like, you know, already just having such access and hangouts with these, uh, you know, quote it's, unquote rock stars, yeah. it, it, you, it probably wasn't a jump for you. No. Yeah. But it's weird that I never, the closest I ever got to Bowie was he was playing at Hartford Civic Center and he was in his limousine and I walked up to the window and we waved at each other. That's Aww. as close as I got to him, which is so weird. Like, what the hell? Yeah. That ain't right. Mm-hmm. Um, Charles Bradley. Ah, well, first came Otis Redding. Well, I, when, okay, let's talk about him first. He was when on I my was a kid, mental like, list. You know, yeah. I love Bowen and Bowie, but I've always gone nuts for scratchy voices. So I love Otis. I don't even remember when I started with him. I was Would a your kid. parents or a, a brother, sister have, or no, you don't have any sisters, <laughs> or a brother have that I record? Just, I don't think they had Otis, but my mother had all kinds of like good, you know, old soul records. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, there was there was quite a mix at our house, which yeah. is still what I listen to. You know, right. quite a mix of stuff. But yeah, and then uh, no one's voice ever got me like that until Charles Bradley came along. Where'd you hear it? Mm, I had just gotten divorced, and uh, I was sad, <laughs> and I opened my computer. I went on AOL, and the screen opened up, and it's like, new video from Charles Bradley, and I looked at him, and I said, oh, this is going to be good. And it was, the world is going up in flames, and then as soon as I saw him, I mean, the first second of his voice, and I was like, oh my God, I... I have to see this guy. I need to meet this guy. You know, the, the line, don't tell me how to live my life when you never felt the pain. I was like, because oh, I've, you know, I've been through tragic loss in yeah. my life, like horrifying. The average person does not have to go through. Right. And as you know, I just right. went through another one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't even want to get started because yeah. I'll start yeah. crying. But um, yeah, that, and then for like, I wasn't on Facebook then. Like I, re- I, I'm late to Facebook and social media. I didn't want to live that way, but then I realized um, I need. I wanted to help promote him, and also you find out where people are playing and everything because I kept trying to see him, and I'd find out too late. And um, so I did finally get to see him like a few years after. You know, being like totally obsessed with them. I finally got to see him live in Boston at the Orpheum. And uh, that was, you know, life-changing for me, you know. And I met him because he accidentally walked into the audience instead of walking to the backstage. He came out in the audience. And uh, it's weird. Like, I didn't see him. I was sitting with my brother, Colin, and I was... My nephew, James, had just texted me pictures of him. It was Halloween, and he was dressed as Jesus. And he looked real authentic, too, James. As, as Jesus, he had the beard glued on, and, you know, he had Jesus' hair at the time anyway. So I'm looking at the pictures, and Colin's like, Kel, he's, you know, nudging me. He's like, there he is. I'm like, what? He goes, there he is. And I froze, and he goes, get up there, get out there. He goes, this is your time. This is your chance. Do it. And there was a bunch of people. They had seen him come out that way, so they were lined up, and I pushed through everybody. I pushed through everybody. I said, these people want to meet you, but I need to. So we talked for a bit. He was the sweetest, sweetest thing ever. And you, you saw him a couple of times. Well, not even just see him, but you, you hung out oh, with him yeah, a couple yeah. times. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I've seen him nine times. I saw him nine times. Yeah, and you had plans to have dinner with him. Yes, right? yeah. before he died. That was our last time we spoke, a couple months before he died. I was going over for dinner. He was going to make macaroni and cheese, and I was making a peach pie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's weird. Like, a few months before he died, kind of last minute, like a week before, I'd, he, had, he was playing. He had, he had cancer and then recovered and then went back out on the road. And um, he was playing, like, festival. I don't like festivals. I don't want to be outside at a festival. Not the type. And uh, so I saw in his schedule, there's only one place he was playing that was a theater. It was the Montreal Jazz Festival, but he was playing a theater. It was called Metropolis. So then, like, last minute, you know, I called Welcome Up, and I said, you know, you think I could drive there by myself? You think I'd be all right? And 
we're talking about it, and he's, he, he really, like, supported me. He goes, you know what, just do it. You can do it. Just, just go, just go. I'm so glad that, like, he, like, you know, pushed me and supported me on that because so I jumped in my car, drove there. Normally it takes, like, five and a half hours to get there because we used to go there all the time. It took, like, eight hours because once I hit Montreal, it was um, the jazz festival traffic. It was well worth it, though. And, um, you know, when I saw Charles before the show, and when he heard that I drove there by myself, he's like, oh, no, I feel so bad. He's like, I wish I knew. I feel so bad. I would have drove with you. And then the next day when he was leaving, he was like, I wish I knew, because they were getting on a plane. He's like, I would have rode home with you. He's like, I feel so bad. I was like, no, don't feel bad. I'm happy. I'm here with you. And that was, of all the times I've seen him, that was the most amazing, amazing show. He always was amazing. Every show he gave, he sang like it was, you know, the, his last day on earth. It was just like, whoa. And there was um, a Montreal uh, soul funk band that opened for them um, called the, for the Brooks. And um, with this amazing singer, Alan Pratter. I don't know if you pronounce it Pratter or Prater. I should know because he's a friend of mine now. They were, like, I remember going out there. Well, first I was hanging with Charles before the show, and then I was like, all right, I got to go now. I said, Charles, I got to go push through a 1,000 Canadians so I can get up front from my band. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, oh, I like it. She's feisty. Uh, so uh, that's what I did. I pushed, but the Canadians are real nice. I just weaseled through. I was like, no one was getting in my way. I had to always see him right in front of his face. So anyway, the band, the the opening band, I was thinking, oh, they better hurry up. I need to see my man. You know, I just wanted them to be done with. But then when I heard him, I was like, holy shit, they're amazing. They're so good, so good. Um, the singer at one point was uh, one of Michael Jackson's backing vocalists. I think he was in Cool in the Gang at one point. Not Cool in the Gang, Cameo. They, they were just, they turned out to be the, the coolest guys. You know, like I'm friends with them, the two of the guys in the band. Just great. And... Uh, I just thank God that I saw Charles that night, you know. I, I, when I came back to his dressing room after the show, you know, he had given me a rose during the show. And I came up and I said, thank you. And he goes, I saw you. I saw you. He said, I said to myself, she did it. I said, that's right, you know. <laughs> and then so the next morning I said goodbye to him. We made our plans, you know. Um, he had, he said in a few, he said, I'm going to call you in a few weeks. You know, and we're definitely going to come over. And, you know, my, my dream, it was my dream to like, have dinner with Charles Bradley <laughs> and make him a peach pie. And he goes, peach is my favorite. And I said, it's mine too. So anyway, you know, that I didn't hear from him and, or, you know, and then a few months later he was gone. So that was, uh, it was the, well, actually, running away to see Aerosmith, I guess that's, that's the furthest I've traveled for a show. Mm -hmm. But, you know, other than that, it's to drive, drive into Montreal mm. for a show. But it was one of Sounded the good. best things ever. I'm yeah. glad I did it. Oh. Uh, I can't think of anything. Can you? No, I'm trying to think. Like, if I have more to ask about, like, the 70s New Haven scene. But um, I don't think so. That's also, like... Back in the day, was when Toads was actually really cool. Yeah, so I talk mean, about that because like that that that's on its last legs, at least from an artistic everybody standpoint. Everybody played, that. and I would just go whether I liked a band or not. I would just go see everybody, you know, at the Coliseum and at Toads. I mean, Toads even had that Rolling Stone show. Like Were you there for that? Show. No, yeah. I didn't know about that, but yeah, um, yeah. Like every, I, you know, everybody played. Like I saw you two there. It was like they just came out. My dad was at that show. Yeah. We talked about yep, that. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, it was just so nice to have, like, a great rock club, but I don't think there's much there anymore. Does so you, would you be out every night of the week? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to see music. You yeah. Know? Which you can still do in New Haven. It's great. I mean, it's one of the, you know, few cities of that size that you could do that. Yeah. And then, like, you know, for years also, I was going out a lot in, in Brooklyn, you know, seeing Charles Bradley and... Daptone bands, yeah. The Daptone and Budos band. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, I'll go anywhere to see Lee Fields. All right, talk about him a little bit. That's like, uh, 
He's up there with Charles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I uh, discovered him around the same time as Charles. Like a l- little late. Not, not well, too long after. They're on the same after. label, right? No, no. No, but it's all the same people yes, pretty yeah. much. They're all intertwined. Um, yeah, he's amazing. And thank God. I think he's recording a new record now. And uh, thank God he's still touring and everything. So when things start up again, I, th- I think he's starting touring again, but nothing around here yet. So that's somebody that I've been wanting to get in New Haven, um, probably at, like, College Street. Yeah. 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 We got to get him in New Haven. We do. You know, because we've traveled for him. And I know he wants to play here, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's a peach. He is. And and his show, as you know, is like. Showstopper. It's a showstopper, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So um, right now I'm. I'm recording new songs. Oh, right. So, yeah, I didn't yeah. know if you wanted to talk about yeah. that or not. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so just just started a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I rec- tracked one song in Brooklyn, one song at Ron Sutphin's studio in Durham here. Um, so I'm back in Brooklyn doing some backing vocals Tuesday. So getting that all started again. I have like a few songs You're doing it fast. Out. Yeah, Rich yeah. Rich is cracking the whip. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't want it to take a hundred years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, see what happens. Yeah, and I I do want to record some more T Rex. Do you think you'll play live at some point? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Right now, it's like I'm mostly concerned with recording. Yeah, and the yeah. tracks. You know, because putting a band together is a whole different yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Plus, I'm just getting back on my feet after my tragic loss of my nephew. So mm. that's been right. brutal. Mm-hmm. You know, losing a child. Mm-hmm. You don't ever expect that. No. And he was, you know, the love of my life. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's good that I could do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. But see, when I was with Welcome, you know, he had a... Re- a with his musical partner, he had a recording studio. So I kind of lived for a good 10 years. I lived in a recording mm-hmm. studio. I was always recording stuff. Yeah. You know, um, even, you know, didn't put it out, a lot of it, but just always working on stuff. Yeah. It's nice when, like, you know, you had that and there's no meter running. <laughs> you mm-hmm. can just, you know, go and record. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, boy, the vacuums are in back of us oh, now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and to that point too, and and I've, I think, all music fans, and um, probably artists, musicians, like feel like like music does get you through like the most painful of times, like oh, whether yeah. like you know high school for me, certain yeah losses of of certain friends or family, um, it's just such a powerful art form. Yeah, you know, we Although, wouldn't be here with, without. Yeah, it. right. I know. Although for uh, this, this has never really happened to me like this. When James died in February, I didn't listen to music for months, months. I could not listen to anything because I didn't want any of my music attached to it. And I'm still only slowly bringing it back. Mm-hmm. Like I don't listen to too much because. I don't know. I don't want to attach to it, and also it'll some stuff could hurt me too much. Yeah, so it I makes nev- sense. Yeah, I never went through that before. Like, I lost my father, the other love of my life, tragically. But I, I didn't really, I don't remember really, like, not listening to any music. But anything that I probably did listen to, you attach it to that, mm-hmm. and then I won't listen to it again. Right. Any kind of bad time you're going through, if you're listening to something... You don't want to hear it again. Yeah, so music will often d- take you back to yeah, the so time you were listening to or the time you discovered it. I'm right? so glad that I didn't listen to anything for months when James died because it's none of my music is tainted that right, way. Right. Um, but also, I didn't even ha- feel the need to listen to anything. Mm-hmm. You know, I just didn't. And, and normally in my car, I'm the DJ of my car. Always have music, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Always have it all lined up. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so now I'm just trying to dive into this again. Yeah, it sounds it's great. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's good because it's a positive thing to yeah. just, like, try to, you know, keep me going. 
That was my conversation with Kelly Riley. Here's another track called Ready for the Morning. Follow Kelly Riley on social media and buy her music at Bandcamp. You say you don't care about this world anymore. You say the good times have fallen. You say there's no way for your mind to restore you to when the sweet times were calling. Look around, the world's always changing. This is where you. been down underneath the ocean of sound got bloody Let it 